everybody, let's begin. To understand mascots in hockey, it's useful to first understand how mascots came to be in the first place. In the 1880s in France, there was an opera called La Mascotte, referring to a character who was a source of good luck. Around that same time, an organized sport in the United States was making a splash, baseball. An 1883 publication, The Sporting Life, described a team that saw its bat boy as their good luck charm, or mascot. The next year, the Cincinnati Inquirer wrote about a goat that was hanging around the local baseball team, referring to it as a mascot as well. Mascots would exist for decades as either real-life animals or even humans. Has anyone ever taken you to a sporting event, and then that team won, and your friend said, hey, you're my good luck charm? Well then, that would make you a mascot. Around the time of World War II, an amateur baseball player named Max Patkin began entertaining crowds with clown-like antics, even wearing his baseball cap sideways. 1964 introduced us to the first full costume mascot characters, Mr. Met for the New York Mets and Brutus Buckeye for Ohio State. Mascots began to popularize in the 1970s and into the 1980s. Hockey would soon follow suit. In 1983, a 23-year-old named Grant Kelba would create the NHL's first mascot who was still around today, Harvey the Hound. Kelba was performing as a mascot for the Calgary Stampeders as Ralph the Dog in arena football. The Flames had already been planning to debut a mascot. They literally had a proposal to use a flaming C for one of their options. Kelba preferred to take on a personality he was already used to, and he worked out an agreement with the Flames PR department so that he could develop his own costume and his own persona. He landed on a Siberian Husky because it's part of a team, like in dog sledding, and it can withstand the bitter cold endured by many in Canada. In his first game, the Flames beat the Pittsburgh Penguins 10-3. Two Flames had hat tricks in that game. Kelbo would don the mascot garb for 15 more years, paving the way for mascots and the NHL as a whole. He would even make it so far as Japan to promote the league. But depending on how you argue it, Harvey may have not been the NHL's first mascot. In the original Six era in 1952, two fish merchants began a tradition that has lasted through six decades, throwing an octopus onto the ice for their home team, the Detroit Red Wings. Now, why an octopus? Because back in 1952, a team would need to win eight playoff games in order to capture a Stanley Cup. The arena manager, Al Sabotka, took on the task of clearing the ice of all octopi. So when Joe Louis Arena decided to take the tradition to a whole new level, it began to feature a giant purple octopus, aptly named Al, being lifted into the rafters. So while Al the mascot is not someone who's in a costume, he is definitely in the arena as a good luck charm when his team needs him most. And then the Red Wings would eventually have two Owls because then that way you have 16 limbs total, 16 wins to go four rounds and win the Stanley Cup. In the late 1960s and the early 70s, the Pittsburgh Penguins recruited two real-life penguins. It was difficult for the birds to acclimate to the arena conditions, so they only lasted a couple of years. In 1976, and even though he was only around briefly, the Philadelphia Flyers technically had a mascot before Gritty. This guy here is Slapshot, and here we say Gritty's creepy. In 1982, for a few seasons, the Red Wings actually had a costume mascot named Winger. Later in the 80s, because there was already a bison mascot in town with a minor league baseball team, the Buffalo Sabres opt for their best option, a saber-toothed tiger. Sabretooth's costume also resembles the team's colors. He's not just wearing a jersey, so his stripes and his base color are in correlation with the team's colors. So when the Sabres later changed their uniform colors to red and black in the late 1990s, Sabretooth made the remarkable adjustment as well. In 1990, the LA Kings debuted Kingston, a snow leopard. Later on in 07-08, they would introduce their new mascot, Bailey the Lion. Kingston was revived later on with the AHL Ontario Reign. In 1992, this was a pretty busy year for mascots. Fresh off of back-to-back -back Stanley Cups, the Pittsburgh Penguins give the fans even more to cheer about by bringing in Iceberg to the Pittsburgh Civic Arena. Just a couple years later, Iceberg's costume would be used in the 1995 Jean-Claude Van Damme film, Sudden Death, which takes place at the arena during Game 7 of the Stanley Cup. One of the newest teams, the San Jose Sharks, capitalize on more than its fresh teal color. They introduce S.J. Sharky, a whippersnapper of an elasma brick. In the 1999 season, Sharky gets tangled up while trying to rappel to the ice. He's dangling 40 feet 
from the playing surface while the lineups are announced and the national anthem is sung. The game was delayed for 20 minutes while the crew tr tried to figure out how to get Sharky out of it. Luckily, everybody was okay, nobody was harmed. That same year, in their first season, the Ottawa Senators debuted Spartacat. The next year, the New Jersey Devils decide to part ways with Slapshot, a giant puck. Yeah, that's, that's what he was. They introduce NJ Devil, and somehow they don't scare opposing fans' children out of the building too frequently. Capitalizing on the hit kids' sports movie and the subsequent TV series, the Mighty Ducks of Anaheim unveil Wildwing. He's the first mascot, to my knowledge, to ever repel from the Raptors. In the team's 1995 home opener, he nearly caught fire when attempting a Ring of Fire stunt. His skates caught on a trampoline, but I think he was okay afterwards. In 1995, still playing at the Maple Leaf Gardens, the Toronto Maple Leafs debut Carlton the Polar Bear. Carlton is one of the more traveled mascots in sports, having visited over 20 different arenas. The fairly new Florida Panthers debut their first mascot, Stanley C. Panther, uh, Stanley C. being Stanley Cup. In 2007, they would also introduce another mascot named Mini Stanley, who's basically Stanley's son. The Washington Capitals also introduced their second mascot, Slapshot the Eagle. They originally had a mascot named Winger, who would still make the rare appearance. Around 1997 or in the late 90s, the Carolina Hurricanes introduced Stormy. A little odd that Stormy is a pig considering that the Carolinas region is known for its hog farms and their delicious pulled pork. In 1998, the Nashville Predators, also new to the NHL, they come into the league and bring with them a saber-toothed cat named Nash. A little less whimsical than saber-tooth, I would say. Around the year 2000, the Columbus Blue Jackets debuted a yellow jacket named Stinger. Stinger is actually green by color, that's because he apparently like fused his yellow jacket skin with the Columbus Blue Jackets primary jersey, and that's why he's green. That's, that's what I understood from something I read. He actually has a yellow tail though, but nonetheless, your mascot is a totally different color. The next year, the Vancouver Canucks introduced Finn the Orca. Unlike most NHL mascots, Finn is actually listed as a goaltender by position. He is also unique in that he can shoot steam from his blowhole. In 2004, 25 years into his Montreal Expos career, Yupi received troubling news that his franchise was moving to Washington DC to become the Nationals. He became the first professional league mascot to switch sports, going over to the Canadiens. The next year in 05, the former Winnipeg Jets have been in the Phoenix Metro for almost a decade. They finally unveiled their first mascot named Howler the Coyote. In 2007, the same year that the Kings debut Bailey as their new mascot, 40 years into their existence, the St. Louis Blues introduced Louie. In 2008, the Minnesota Wilds still can't figure out which animal their logo resembles, so they continue that with their mascot, Nordy. Now, a bear, a fox, a puma, a man bear pig, I'll, I'll leave that up to you. The next year, the Colorado Avalanche introduced their second mascot, Bernie. St. Bernards are one of the more common breeds used for avalanche rescue situations. The franchise was about nine years old without a mascot. Their original mascot was a Yeti named Howler. In a 1999 match between the visiting Blackhawks and the Avs, a Blackhawks fan cited Howler as causing injuries to her, so that mascot was soon thereafter retired. In 2010, one of the more dubious mascots was ever introduced, Boomer the Cannon. Let's just say he drew some sharp criticism not because of how he behaved, but just because of how he appeared. Around the early 2010s, I couldn't figure out exactly when he debuted, but my understanding is that Blades the Bruin came into existence at this time. Jillian Dempsey, formerly of Harvard and now the Boston Pride of the National Women's Hockey League, had actually named the Bear herself. In 2011, now that hockey's back in Winnipeg, the Jets need a new mascot, and they opt for Mick E. Moose, a character with plenty of experience under his belt with the AHL Manitoba Moose. In 2014, the Florida Panthers introduced yet another mascot, Victor E. Rat. Yes, a rat as an NHL mascot. For those of you who weren't around, in 1995, Panthers forward Scott Mellenby killed a rat in the locker room prior to the home opener. Once the word got around, fans would throw plastic rats onto the ice following a home team goal. Maybe one of the greatest mascot conception stories you'll ever hear. That same year, the Dallas Stars also kidnapped the Philly Fanatic and they Oh wait, I'm sorry, they, they, I'm sorry, they just like really copied the Philly Fanatic and they created Victor E. Green. In 2016, the Winnipeg Jets resurrect their original mascot from the 80s and the 90s, a blue fellow named Benny, 
both named after original owner Ben Hatskin, as well as Elton John's song, Benny and the Jets. Great song. In 2017, seeing signs of success under the helm of Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl, the Edmonton Oilers give their fans something to cheer about unless they're already stricken with terror. The Vegas Golden Knights start off their franchise with Chance, a Gila monster, which is a type of lizard found in that area. The performer behind Chance brings 15 years of mascotting experience, coming from the Arizona State Sun Devils, the Arizona Cardinals, and both the St. Louis and Los Angeles Rams. The Carolina Hurricanes also introduce Caroline, their second mascot into my understanding, the first female mascot in the NHL. And then in 2018, we got this guy. Now, you've probably seen a lot of gritty videos and you know followed him on social media and all that good stuff, so I'm actually gonna focus on a couple of quotes that came from his designer. His name is Brian Allen. So here's what Brian had to say when conceiving gritty. Consumers today are pretty savvy. Everyone everywhere is trying to sell us something. So if you just come out with a traditional and safe mascot that's just so obviously a cookie cutter mascot, people are really going to be turned off by that and he wouldn't last a year. People would just forget about him and ignore him. So instead, we just tried to make this mascot this creature that no one has ever seen. And I can't believe I'm saying this, but some of Alan's initial sketches had gritty looking even scarier with downturned eyebrows, fangs, and missing or chipped teeth but the Flyers wanted Gritty to be more family-friendly and approachable for, for children. Someone you'd want to give a high-five to, but not necessarily a hug. Now, I left out a few other mascots. I couldn't find exactly when they were introduced to the team. Sparky the Dragon, before the Charles Wang regime, the Isles had this guy named Niles. Good Lord. Niles was eventually replaced with Sparky. The Islanders had announced that Sparky would not return when the club began playing games at the Barclays Center, but about three months later, amid struggling ticket sales, the club brought Sparky back. Thunderbug is the Tampa Bay Lightning's mascot. Now in 2012, a video went viral of Thunderbug spraying a Bruins fan with silly string. The performer was soon after terminated, but not just for that incident, so Thunderbug used to be a real troublemaker. Speaking of troublemaking, Tommy Hawk rallies fans of the Chicago Blackhawks. Now, if you recall earlier this season, a fan had attacked Tommy, but the mascot wrestled the fan to the ground and escorted him to security in the, in the team's store. Very nice work, Tom. Now, I think that maybe self-defense is something that mascots have been taught, especially after Tommy was clobbered by Nordy when celebrating Nordy's birthday. Some of the NHL's now defunct teams had mascots as well. The Quebec Nordiques had Bada Boom, this blue seal looking critter. The Atlanta Thrashers had Thrash, which pays homage to the state bird of, of Georgia. And then, of course, the Hartford Whalers had Pucky the Whale and Wally the Whaler. I also wanted to talk about some of the ways that mascots are involved in the community and with fans on a more personal level. So there are a couple of great stories around the Calgary Flames that I'll share. Flames goaltender David Riddick was hosting his brother Tomasz from the Czech Republic or Czechia. Now, Tomasz has autism, and so he has special needs. Riddick knew that his brother was a huge Harvey the Hound fan, so when he surprised Tomasz with a meet and greet, Tomasz was so excited that he lifted Harvey off the ground. Harvey is so popular that a couple had actually asked Harvey to be the ring bearer at their wedding. Now, I don't know if he actually did that, but I think that's pretty funny. With the Los Angeles Kings, there's Bailey's Buddies. Bailey's Buddies benefits Ace Bailey's Children's Foundation. So Ace Bailey was a NHL veteran of, God, I think like 30 plus years. And he unfortunately was killed in the September 11th terrorist attacks. Um, before that, he had served as the Kings director of pro scouting. So Bailey is actually named after this former player, Ace Bailey. The Ace Bailey Children's Foundation focuses on the well-being of hospitalized children through the building and renovation of hospital environments that improve the family-centered and softer side of hospital care. Another great story that I saw, in 2016, there was the Fort McMurray fire in Alberta. There was a family who, when they escaped, their son had sent out a tweet, and it was a picture of these jerseys that he had saved. They were all San Jose Sharks jerseys. I guess he was a Sharks fan. So anyway, SJ Sharkey saw the tweet, and he offered to send the son a signed jersey. But then the Sharks went an extra step, and they flew the family out from Alberta all the way to California for a conference finals game. That's pretty awesome. 
Mascots, as you know, are involved in a lot of other initiatives, whether that's, you know, building playgrounds for kids, uh, helping kids with reading and literacy, uh, working with, you know, people with disabilities. Mascots do so much beyond their stunts on the ice, really. There's a lot that I, I didn't even get to in this video. And so with kids and, you know, various audiences, sometimes people with disabilities, you saw that, that photo of Bailey with veterans, uh, World War II veterans, you know, there is a component of emotional readiness and, and being able to handle certain situations and, and the education that goes into that that I think makes mascots actually very specialized, um, you know, in addition to what they're doing physically in a, you know, in a suit that's probably 110, 115 degrees inside. So really, you know, give, give these mascots a lot of credit. You know, the next time you're at a game and you see somebody in a suit, you know, or in a mascot suit, Give that person a high five, not just to say go team, but to, you know, kind of pat them on the back for what they've done because they've really worked super hard to get to where they are right now. As we saw with the Calgary Flames mascot, as we've seen, you know, with Vegas, that guy has you know, 15 years of experience. And I mean, God only knows what the demands are for somebody who's wearing Grady's outfit as well. So anyway, anyway, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a like. And if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to the channel. I'm putting out weekly videos on oddball hockey topics, homebrew statistical analyses, jersey unboxings, and more. Because it's All-Star Weekend, I hope to be covering the All-Star festivities here in San Jose. I don't know exactly how I'll do that, but keep it locked to my social media. You can follow me on Twitter at Nick underscore Pinkerton. Okay, everyone, this has been Nick with Twisted Rister Hockey. Thanks for tuning in, and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you.